Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be continuing our journey through A.W. Tozer's The Pursuit of God. I have to say, since recording our last episode, which was in the first half of chapter 7, I've just been really looking forward to finishing this chapter with you because I have found it so fascinating. Tozer's been taking us on a journey through an idea that our faith is really our soul, our spirit's gaze upon the goodness of God. That how we perceive him by our sort of spiritual eyes is then drawing us more deeply into him. It's been this very almost mystical, metaphysical, philosophical way of thinking about it, but I found it completely captivating. So I've been thinking about it, and I can't wait to get back at it. We're going to be starting in our Timeless Series edition of the book on page 102. Faith is not in itself a meritorious act. The merit is in the one toward whom it is directed. Faith is a redirecting of our sight, a getting out of the focus of our own vision and getting God into focus. Sin has twisted our vision inward and made it self-regarding. Unbelief has put self where God should be and is perilously close to the sin of Lucifer, who said, I will set my throne above the throne of God. Faith looks out instead of in, and the whole life falls into line. All this may seem too simple, but we have no apology to make. To those who would seek to climb into heaven after help or descend into hell, God says, the word is nigh thee, even the word of faith. The word induces us to lift up our eyes unto the Lord, and the blessed work of faith begins. When we lift our inward eyes to gaze upon God, we are sure to meet friendly eyes gazing back at us. For it is written that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. The sweet language of experience is, Thou, God, seest me. When the eyes of the soul looking out meet the eyes of God looking in, heaven has begun right here on this earth. Just earlier today, I was working on a talk for our fellowship called The Anchor, and I was reminding my friends that I'll be speaking to on Sunday that when we know people who are seeking after God, all we have to do is continue to walk with them. Sometimes they don't need our finest argument. Sometimes what they need is to be encouraged in their spiritual hunger. I'll give you an example. In about 30 minutes, I'm going to get in the car and drive over to meet with a friend of mine who's an atheist. About once a month, we take a walk. And what I have learned in walking with my friend is that by asking questions about his own sort of spiritual ponderings, I have found over years that he has gotten closer and closer to actually investigating the reality of Jesus for himself. Not in the way that I could have argued him into, but by his own earnest sort of God-given search after truth, well, he is on his way to actually really knowing Jesus. I think that's what Jesus means when he says to his friends, ask and you will seek, sorry, seek and you will find, ask and you will knock and the door will be open. Like an idea that, As we seek, we realize that he has been seeking us. That's what Tozer is getting at here. So my encouragement to you is to be deeply about your own search after Jesus, and it will actually pull people along with you. As you raise your own gaze out of your own inward self, it's like you're helping others to see where to look. It's a joy in your own journey, and I think it's instructive for those who are around you. Let's keep reading. This is a quote. When all my endeavor is turned toward thee, because all thy endeavor is turned toward me, when I look unto thee alone with all my attention, nor ever turn aside the eyes of my mind, because thou dost enfold me with thy constant regard, when I direct my love toward thee alone, because thou, who art love's self, hast turned thee toward me alone, And what, Lord, is my life, 
save that embrace wherein thy delightsome sweetness doth so lovingly enfold me. That would be an unquote there. So wrote Nicholas of Cusa, or Cusa, 400 years ago. I should like to say more about this old man of God. He is not much known today anywhere among Christian believers, and among current fundamentalists, he is known not at all. I feel that we could gain much from a little acquaintance with men of his spiritual flavor and the school of Christian thought which they represent. Christian literature, to be accepted and approved by the evangelical leaders of our times, must follow very closely the same train of thought, a kind of party line from which it is scarcely safe to depart. A half century of this in America has made us smug and content. We imitate each other with slavish devotion, and our most strenuous efforts are put forth to try to say the same thing that everyone around us is saying, and yet to find an excuse for saying it, some little safe variation on the approved theme, or if no more, at least a new illustration. By the way, let's pause for a moment and just say, that's the heart of why Seahart Press exists. Maybe some of you have been introduced to our Timeless Series Edition books. I think we have more than 20 of them. And these are books from throughout church history, all the way back to the fourth century with Athanasius, coming all the way up into the early 20th century, where we deal in thinkers and writers who have just been absolutely entirely about their pursuit of Jesus and bringing forth into the church's view a real, deep, exploration in the spirit of what it really means to be a disciple. So if you kind of feel the same way as Tozer was just talking, that sometimes when you look at sort of popular Christian writing, it's like all of the same thing, just sort of remixed, or sometimes it's just the same five thoughts put into different words, well, come check out the rest of our Seaharp Timeless catalog, because we're going to take you on a journey into some thinkers and thoughts that are quite different at times from our modern orthodoxies, or sometimes our shallowness, our inability to think deeply. So just a little plug for good old Sea Harp right there, but that's our heartbeat as well. Let's get back to Nicholas of Cusa. Nicholas was a true follower of Christ, a lover of the Lord, radiant and shining in his devotion to the person of Jesus. His theology was orthodox, but fragrant and sweet as everything about Jesus might properly be expected to be. His conception of eternal life, for instance, is beautiful in itself and, if I mistake not, is nearer in spirit to John 17.3 than that which is current among us today. Life eternal, says Nicholas, is, quote, not other than that blessed regard wherewith thou never ceasest to behold me, yea, even in the secret places of my soul. With thee, to behold is to give life. Tis unceasingly to impart sweetest love of thee. Tis to inflame me to love of thee by love's imparting, and to feed me by inflaming, and by feeding to kindle my yearning, and by kindling to make me drink of the dew of gladness, and by drinking to infuse in me a fountain of life, and by infusing to make it increase and endure." Unquote. <laughs> now, if faith is the gaze of the heart at God, and if this gaze is but the raising of the inward eyes to meet the all-seeing eyes of God, then it follows that it is one of the easiest things possible to do. It would be like God to make the most vital thing easy and place it within the range of possibility for the weakest and poorest of us. You might have noticed I didn't unquote properly at the end of the paragraph before that because frankly, I was so like lost in the glory of it. So I wanna revisit just for a moment. Nicholas of Cusa, the way that he defines what eternal life is, just listen to some of these descriptions. It is to behold. It is to unceasingly have imparted to us the love of God. It's to be inflamed to love. It is to be fed by that inflaming. It is to be fed by a kindling of a yearning 
and by that kindling to make me drink of the dew of gladness, and by that drinking to infuse in me a fountain of life, and by that infusion to always increase and endure. Do you see how eternal life is this crazy, glorious, sort of self-perpetuating infinitude of God's work within us, leading to another piece of God's work in us, through us, and out of us, how it all is sourced in our unceasing gaze upon the goodness of God and what it wants to do in us. That sounded like a big mouthful, and that's how it felt to me, but friends, eternal life is simply to share the life of God and to let him share everything that he has for us, through us, and in us. It's, it's to like go down and inside into the inner place, that inner life, that spirit he's given us, and to literally meet with him there, to gaze upon him and find life in him, and then to go out into the world around us and to give it away. It's so simple. I love that he uses the word there, easy. One of the easiest things possible to do. That ease is simply to come to him each day and say, Lord, have your way in me. Allow me to see more. Allow me to experience more. And then out of that experience, go out and actually give it away. I mean, oh, friends, this is the life we've been given one day at a time. It is rich. It's blessed. And it is absolutely a privilege to carry it and to show it to others. I'll keep reading. Several conclusions may fairly be drawn from all this. The simplicity of it, for instance, uh, since believing is looking, it can be done without special equipment or religious paraphernalia. God has seen to it that the one life and death essential can never be subject to the caprice of accident. Equipment can break down or get lost. Water, can leak away, uh, records can be destroyed by fire, the minister can be delayed or the church burned down. All these are external to the soul and are subject to accident or mechanical failure. But looking is of the heart and can be done successfully by any man standing up or kneeling down or lying in his last agony a thousand miles from any church. Since believing is looking it can be done any time. No season is superior to another season for this sweetest of all acts. God never made salvation depend upon new moons nor holy days or Sabbaths. A man is not nearer to Christ on Easter Sunday than he is, say, on Saturday, August 3rd or Monday, August, October 4th. As long as Christ sits on the mediatorial throne, every day is a good day, and all days are days of salvation. Neither does place matter in this blessed work of believing God. Lift your heart and let it rest upon Jesus, and you are instantly in a sanctuary, though it be a Pullman berth or a factory or a kitchen. You can see God from anywhere, if your mind is set to love and obey him. I think this is what Jesus meant when he was talking to the woman, the Samaritan woman next to the well. This is in John 4. He's talking to her and you can see her defensiveness coming up. It's a defense of religiosity. When she perceives his spiritual power and then tries to make it an argument about, well, you know, your ancestors talked about it being a worship over there and our ancestors believe it. She tries to raise it to the the place and the time, she tries to create sort of a procedural argument against the way of Jesus. I love that Jesus always boils it back to what he would call worshiping in spirit and truth. The idea that I could sit right here in this chair and worship him with everything I've got. I can, when I go to that meeting with my friend in a few minutes, take it with me. You know, the kingdom of God is not found by saying, oh, look, there it is, or look, here it is, because as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is inside you. Friends, we can lift these spiritual eyes, the eyes of our heart, we can lift them to his face wherever we are. He does not say it's only for Sundays or for Wednesdays. He doesn't say, again, like it's only on Easter or Christmas. It's every minute of our earthly lives.
we can look upon Jesus, be set free yet again by him, and follow him. Oh, what a glorious thing is our life in him. I'll keep reading. Now, someone may ask, is not this of which you speak for special persons, such as monks or ministers who have by the nature of their calling more time to devote to quiet meditation? I am a busy worker and have little time to spend alone. I am happy to say that the life I describe is for everyone of God's children, regardless of calling. It is, in fact, happily practiced every day by many hard-working persons and is beyond the reach of none. Many have found the secret of which I speak and, without giving much thought to what is going on within them, constantly practice this habit of inwardly gazing upon God. They know that something inside their hearts sees God. Even when they are compelled to withdraw their conscious attention in order to engage in earthly affairs, there is within them a secret communion always going on. Let their attention but be released for a moment from necessary business, and it flies at once to God again. This has been the testimony of many Christians, so many that even as I state it thus, I have a feeling that I am quoting, though from whom or from how many I cannot possibly know. I do not want to leave the impression that the ordinary means of grace have no value. They most assuredly have. Private prayer should be practiced by every Christian. Long periods of Bible meditation will purify our gaze and direct it. Church attendance will enlarge our outlook and increase our love for others. Service and work and activity all are good and should be engaged in by every Christian. But at the bottom of all these things, giving meaning to them, will be the inward habit of beholding God. A new set of eyes, so to speak, will develop within us, enabling us to be looking at God while our outward eyes are seeing the scenes of this passing world. The way that I explain it to the friends with whom I worship and who I get to sometimes speak to is the remembrance that in the early church, everyone was expected to come ready to every single Sabbath gathering on Sunday. That yes, perhaps there was somebody who had that gift of teaching and was more likely to get up and speak, but if that person was sick or out of town, anyone should be expected to get up and speak. Well, how were they to speak? Did they have the New Testament to read and to gather more information about the New Covenant from? No! For 30 years, they had not one written text that we would call the New Testament. They had to behold God for themselves. They had to be with the Spirit of Jesus to learn from him so that they could get up, if they got called up, to speak this next Sunday. Would that be true for you? Have your beholdings of God, has your own inward gaze upon Jesus been so robust this week that if on Sunday, whether you have a huge church with a thousand people in worship or you meet with 20 people, what if the person up front said, <clears throat> you know, my throat's kind of hurting. I need you to come up front and share from your own beholding of God this week. Could you do it? Would you feel confident that you had something directly from him, from your gaze upon him, that you could share with your brothers and sisters? It's a good clarifying question, isn't it? I'll keep reading. Someone may fear that we are magnifying private religion out of all proportion, that the us of the New Testament is being displaced by a selfish I. And if you've been with me from the first episode of this series of Reading Together, you know that this was something I highlighted in the foreword to the book, so I'll keep going. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So, 
100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Social religion is perfected when private religion is purified. The body becomes stronger as its members become healthier. The whole church of God gains when the members that compose it begin to seek a better and a higher life. This is what I was just referring to. If you and I, from Monday through Sunday morning, for ourselves, individually, yes, we're all about gazing upon the face of Jesus in the Gospels, in prayer, in worship, in fellowship with others who are following him. If that was what we were about all the way through each week between worships, imagine the way we would come together Sunday morning. You and I would come so heartful with so much testimony of his alive life that our gazing upon him individually would completely, excitingly energize the collective, the body. Friends, that is the way not only to find health in the church, but also to keep it unified. We do not think about our Presbyterian ways of thinking, our Roman Catholic ways of thinking, our non-denominational ways of thinking. We think about Jesus, his way, the way he carried himself historically in the writings of the four Gospels, and the way that his Holy Spirit has continued to reveal him. The more that's our gaze each week, the more healthy, the more unified will be the body every single Sunday until we go home forever to be with him. Let's not forget it. Let's not think that what we're talking about here with Tozer is individualistic. The reality is each individual following him for ourselves is actually creating the unity of the worldwide body. It's exciting. All right, I'm going to read the last short couple of paragraphs. And we'll have the final prayer of this chapter 7. And boy, what a pleasure this chapter has been. All the foregoing presupposes true repentance and a full committal of the life to God. It is hardly necessary to mention this, for only persons who have made such a committal will have read this far. When the habit of inwardly gazing Godward becomes fixed within us, we shall be ushered onto a new level of spiritual life, more in keeping with the promises of God and the mood of the New Testament. The triune God will be our dwelling place, even while our feet walk the low road of simple duty here among men. We will have found life's summum bonum, which means the greatest, the best, the highest of goods indeed. This is again now from the vision of God from Nicholas of Cusa. I quote, There is the source of all delights that can be desired. Not only can not better be thought out by men and angels, but not better can exist in mode of being. For it is the absolute maximum of every rational desire than which a greater cannot be. Unquote. And now the prayer. O Lord, I have heard a good word inviting me to look away to Thee and be satisfied. My heart longs to respond, but sin has clouded my vision till I see Thee but dimly. Be pleased to cleanse me in Thine own precious blood and make me inwardly pure, so that I may with unveiled eyes gaze upon Thee all the days of my earthly pilgrimage. Then shall I be prepared to behold thee in full splendor in the day when thou shalt appear to be glorified in thy saints and admired in all them that believe. Amen. Friends, I hope this has been an encouragement to your heart like it's been to mine. It makes me want to, you know, finish recording this and simply be with him. Gaze upon him. Ask him for more insight, more revelation, of what he has done and what he is still attempting to do in my life and in the body of Christ. Thanks for joining me. That has been the end of chapter seven in the pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. I hope again that this has been a blessing to you. Thank you for joining me. 
and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.